Thank you very much for having me here today. What I hope to bring is a very local perspective. You've heard this morning from probably the leading experts in the world on some of the causes of wrongful conviction. Uh, and I hope to bring you something a little bit different um, so that you can understand what we do here in BC. So along those lines, I just wanted to get a sense of the audience. I checked in with Jenny. How many lawyers do we have in this room? I know I can probably name them all. Mark, Martin, Karen, Richard. <laughs> That's four lawyers in the room. Uh, of the rest of you, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> uh, of the rest of you, how many police officers? One, two, three, four, like maybe a handful, 10 or something. And the rest of you are criminology, students and, and graduates, I'm suspecting? All right, so uh, people unfamiliar with the Innocence Project, first of all, I have to, to credit Peter, because when I started working in this area, I was um, a defense lawyer, but before that I was Crown Counsel, and before that I articled in the defense world. Uh, so I've been on both sides, and then I started teaching uh, when I had a family, and when we were teaching a, an evidence course and looking at some of the problems uh, with admissibility of certain types of evidence, reliability of certain types of evidence, we thought it would be um, useful to start a project like we had read about, the Innocence Project, uh, a post-conviction review organization within the law school that we saw as a great opportunity for students who would be going into criminal practice, either on the Crown or Defense side, to learn about some of these problems and difficulties and ways to evaluate evidence, uh, and would also offer an area of assistance to those that didn't have any representation uh, in British Columbia. And um, we contacted the Innocence Project and worked everything out. We're now a member of the network. And what many people don't know is that uh, post-conviction review organizations uh, are now worldwide. Peter referred to it earlier. In Canada, we have three organizations, really, that work in this area. We have us, uh, and we started in 2007. There's uh, AIDWIC, which many of you have heard about in Toronto, uh, which looks at uh, murder cases across the country. And then there's Osgood Hall's Innocence Project, which started at its project about a year after I graduated there. And ironically now, I'm, uh, my colleague is Alan Young, who was my criminal law professor, uh, when we look at uh, wrongful convictions and compare notes on what's happening in Canada. So we have a very few number of people in Canada looking at these issues. And the way our project worked, and we modeled it on some of the projects in the States and Osgood's project, is we have uh, external supervising lawyers, those that I named in the audience, Audience are some of those supervising lawyers in the community uh, in uh, Vancouver and try to spread out a little bit into the valley and the island uh, who work with students to look at claims of wrongful conviction in BC, mostly in BC. I've made the odd exception um, that we are looking at a couple of cases in Alberta and Saskatchewan, but in my view it becomes increasingly more difficult uh, when you're outside of your, your local community uh, because it really helps to know the system and the players. So we started the project and we opened our doors in 2007 and with the exception of this year when uh, Mark has been uh, the acting director of the project, uh, I've been working on these cases with the students. And some say, well, you know, like the Innocence Project in New York, they get thousands and thousands of applications. Well, they imprison many more people <laughs> in the States than they do in Canada. And here, I would say that we do not have um, you know, a huge number of applications every year. We may be, you know, we have fairly uh, strict criteria, but we may be open two or three new files a year, uh, and it takes us a long time, which I will get into some of the obstacles we face, but it takes us a really long time because we have the students for basically what I count as six months of the year, and uh, those six months we are one of their many other courses. So they get three credits a term for working with us on these cases, and then the supervising lawyers, we have about 30 supervising lawyers uh, in the community, and they work with these students, but uh, they are doing it off the side of their desks and pro bono to review these cases. So we're looking at cases that are just factual innocence claims, so we're not looking at cases uh, with charter defenses uh, or uh, regular run-of-the-mill uh, uh, defenses other than I wasn't the guy uh, that did it or the girl, the woman that, that committed this crime or this wasn't a crime. So we're looking at factual innocence. We're mostly looking at cases where appeals are exhausted. We don't 
limit it to people who are still incarcerated. We have one applicant who is uh, no longer incarcerated. Uh, and we don't limit it to uh, de just DNA cases. So we're looking at cases that are both DNA and non-DNA cases. And as you, as you heard earlier of the DNA exonerations in the United States, there's about 330, a little over. And of the non-DNA cases, there's over 1,700. So it's a huge, huge issue uh, in, the, in the United States. And when I go to the conferences, uh, I finally feel like I found, found my people. Because in Canada, you don't sort of have that group of people um, that come together on a regular basis to discuss the issues and the problems in, in working through uh, some of these huge, huge, uh, huge cases. Uh, so in the States, it's really uh, what they describe as a, a, a new civil rights movement in, in freeing the innocent. And so many innocent uh, are in jail. And you've heard some of the causes. In Canada, I really believe we're at the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of identifying these cases because we have so few people looking at it, so few resources dedicated to it. Uh, and uh, I really hope that in the next 20 years, as we improve some of our procedures around investigating these cases that we will uncover and be able to help uh, a lot more people. So when I looked at what Neil uh, sent us about uh, how and why do criminal investigative failures and wrongful convictions occur, how can we best pre prevent them, and what are the remedies and best mechanisms, uh, you've heard a lot of that already. Um, I wanted to just start a little bit with understanding, um, you know, and we've talked about mistakes. And as Madam Justice McLaughlin uh, said in a, a talk in 2007, actually, the same year we started the project, you know, the justice system is a human system. It's a human endeavor. And as with any human endeavor, we're bound to make mistakes. Uh, and I think if we accept that basic premise, we'll understand why it's necessary to look back. And I absolutely uh, believe that the police and the Crown and defense, everybody have made changes over the years to improve the justice system uh, in Canada and in the States. Uh, but where we struggle is in the looking back. Uh, so it, it's great when, when I hear that policies are now in place and uh, we, we have you know, new techniques, but we need to look back and look at what happened when those techniques and those policies uh, were not in place and where are those people and are they still in jail? Uh, because those are the people that we see applying to our project. And I should say that I know a few of you that are the police officers police officers in the room. Uh, a few of you I know are Abbotsford members. And we have, uh, in our team of students this year, a police officer. Uh, and we have, uh, he's, a, he's an acting Abbotsford member. I'm sure you know him. Uh, and we also have had uh, many students that go to the Crown um, and Crown Council that uh, are, are quite interested and work collaboratively with the project. And we have a good working relationship with uh, Crown Council in BC. Really, you know, what we're looking for is the truth. You know, I, I sometimes get offended. But I've seen in, in correspondence when we've been dealing with the police, uh, innocence project in quotation marks, you know, uh, and I think that's part of the problem is that in Canada, we're not taking what we do and the looking back and the problems that occur uh, as seriously as maybe we should. In Canada, as a justice system, we really need to move uh, towards a recognition of the importance of reviewing these claims, uh, recognizing the mistakes, and remedying them. So we've heard today about misidentification, uh, about failures in forensic uh, evidence and expert forensic witnesses. We've heard about false confessions. To add to this list, I'd like to, uh, to throw in there false testimony. Uh, We've talked about, in wrongful convictions, jailhouse informants. But I think it's just as important uh, to think about unsavory witnesses, what we would classify as unsavory witnesses. Because when you look at the Canadian cases of wrongful conviction, it's not just the jailhouse informant that has led to the wrongful conviction. Uh, they're witnesses that are, are motivated by other factors. And although people take the stand and promise to tell the truth, uh, I'm sure as, as police officers you, knew, you know, certainly as Crown Counsel, I saw, as defense lawyers, I saw people sometimes lie 
for various reasons, and they can lie convincingly, and we're not equipped to know when people are lying. And I think false testimony uh, across the board, uh, whether it is a regular civilian all the way to your jailhouse informant, is one of the major problems uh, in wrongful convictions, and you certainly see it in homicide cases. In, in Canada, because we were having a discussion about this at the break, because we don't put people away for a very long time for sexual offenses, those are tend to be not um, uh, the cases that are I identified later as, as wrongful convictions. We do have a few, but mostly they're homicide cases in Canada, and obviously then mistaken identification is not, go or misidentification is not going to be uh, the sort of the leading cause. So we look at false testimony. Poorly funded defense work, uh, I think this will uh, ring true for some of the lawyers in the room. Uh, the legal aid tariff is terrible. Uh, lawyers that work on, on murder cases, many of which are um, on legal aid, so they're not paid clients, uh, there is very little funding for preparation, very little funding to hire experts, uh, independent experts, very little funding to hire junior counsel to help you on a massive, massive case. And that's not to excuse anybody, but it definitely contributes to the problem. And I have to say that bad defense work is also in there. And uh, you know, we, we try at the project not to uh, throw our colleagues under the bus, and, and oftentimes it's poor training. But even now, you know, after 10 years of doing this work, when I speak to some of the defense lawyers that are, are doing these cases, of course not the people in the room, but <laughs> uh, you know, they've never heard of uh, the NAS report from 2009. Uh, they don't know about the hair microscopy review. Uh, they, they're not aware of some of the leading um, causes of wrongful conviction that can, you know, sort of affect how they practice their, their criminal work. And when we've had supervising lawyers come to the network conference, uh, which is a conference that happens every year, just happened in, in Texas uh, this uh, earlier this month, um, they've come to that conference, and, and these are you know, lawyers that are just supervising a case for us, and it's usually their first experience with a post-conviction case, and they come back and they say, wow, like, I didn't realize how all of this information would affect my actual trial practice. I can really use this in my trial practice to challenge some of the evidence, to, to look at some of these new techniques and challenge what the, um, uh, you know, what the Crown is leading. So, uh, you know, training for defense lawyers, uh, you know, and it's sad to me that there's not more in this room because uh, defense lawyers really should be here to, to have heard at least the morning session, <laughs> never mind hearing from me about some of the problems, but um, defense work is, is really important in this process, and I think that defense lawyers, uh, as much as Crown uh, and police, are susceptible to tunnel, tunnel vision. You know, and as those of you in the room, police officers and, and lawyers alike, know most of the people that uh, defense lawyers represent, and I've represented, you know, are guilty. Uh, and you have to, in this post-conviction world, sort of get out of that mindset, and I think that what we've certainly seen in some of our cases in the office are defense lawyers that have made assumptions uh, about their client's guilt and don't take that objective uh, step back to really look at the evidence um, and assess what has led to the conviction because uh, as uh, one of uh, our esteemed colleagues, uh, Peter Wilson, uh, has written about the Thomas Sofino inquiry, and he lists at the end of this paper he's done on the Sofino inquiry all of the factors that led to that conviction. And if you read the judgment, uh, you would say, there's no way this is an innocent man. But he was innocent, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, you really have to start peeling back all of those layers. And when I talk to the students and we do our orientation at the beginning, I tell them if, if you can come out of this process, this program with one thing, it's to always question the evidence. No matter how strong it looks on its face, uh, you have to peel back the layers. So a witness said, I saw so-and-so do it. Who was that witness? What were their drug habits? You know, how reliable are they? You have to start looking at that. So no matter how strong a case seems, uh, when it comes to us, I, I encourage the students to peel back the layers and look, are some of those red flags in there? And hopefully they carry that into defense practice and their crown practice. Uh, 
overzealous Crown Council, um, we also have seen that in some of our cases, and I, I won't get into that too much. Juries, uh, there was a comment earlier about juries. Uh, in Canada, we don't have the ability to uh, uh, interview jurors after the fact, so we don't know what goes into their uh, thought process. And uh, when you look at, you know, but they can't be that different than uh, the jurors in the United States. And certainly when you read some of the studies that have been done on juries in the United States, you see that jurors do not understand what's going on half the time. And they, they are told and instructed about the concept of reasonable doubt, but when it comes to applying it, uh, it doesn't always work. Um, and no matter how well it's explained, no matter if they're given the instruction, uh, it's a very difficult process. And they also have difficulty, as we've seen, in uh, assessing the weight to be given to expert testimony. So you have somebody up on the stand who's declared an expert, it's very easy for jurors um, to be swayed by that evidence, unless, the defense lawyer is doing its job and, and really challenging uh, the expert and, and putting them to the test. Uh, police tunnel vision, we've talked about that can happen and we've heard from, from Doug Lepard today. Um, this in the post-conviction world has been called, can be called noble cause corruption, uh, where you know they believe that they've got the right guy and uh, doesn't really matter if they have to Cut corners is a bad guy, so let's just get him for this particular crime. And now I'm not saying that that happens in all cases, but when there are certain pressures in certain cases, we've seen in the past in Canadian wrongful convictions a couple times when that has happened, that uh, the um, tunnel vision has uh, played a significant role. And when that happens in the they very uh, quickly come to uh, judgment about who committed the crime. The difficulty is the investigation stops. And then when we get to a post-conviction phase, when we're looking at that investigation, we don't have a lot of the information that we need to look at because the investigation basically stopped once they identified uh, that person. So. Next, how can we prevent wrongful convictions? Uh, some of what I've just discussed, the, the corollary would be true in, in, in addressing those issues to prevent. In an ideal world, now recognizing that funding is always a problem, um, training uh, for both Crown and Defence, which I've touched upon. And by training, you know, I don't mean I know that what happens with Crown in, in BC, there is a conference every year and they have a couple of speakers and they talk about wrongful convictions uh, and they have a couple of hours of exposure to it. And unless they've done the project as a student, that's really all they're going to get until the following year when they have a couple more hours. And I think that more meaningful training has to happen uh, in understanding how wrongful convictions occur on, for both Crown and defense, um, and, and police for that matter. And uh, I was quite thrilled that we had a police officer. Uh, am I OK for time? A few more minutes? OK. All right. Um, I'm going to just run right through these, because I really want to get to, to what I really want to talk about are our remedies. So um, we look at. Um, uh, disclosure policies. So really what I, I want to get to in terms of remedies is uh, there are five things that, now these, it's not an exhaustive list, but five things that I would identify as remedies for responding to the possibility of error. And number one is preservation of evidence. Uh, this is a huge problem uh, that we've seen in the project and I know um, at the Innocence Project in New York, I don't know what the numbers are, but I think it's around 50% of cases are closed because of lost or destroyed evidence, is that about right? Yeah, and we have the same problem. Um, and to give you two examples, we have one case where it's from 1983, there was a ton of evidence that we could have tested uh, now and looked at to find the true perpetrator. Uh, it unfortunately, on a plane between uh, Vancouver and the northern community it was going to was lost, uh, vanished into thin air, and all that is left in that case was for some unknown reason the uh, pathologist took uh, histology or tissue samples uh, of uh, the victim, and that's what we're left with. And now we've been in a battle for about five years to test those samples, uh, which we've done some testing, uh, because it's all that's left of the case because the evidence was lost. Uh, in another case, we have um, 
the applicant was maintaining innocence all along, pursuing, uh, you know, trying to get documents, going through freedom of information, anyone who would listen, trying to get access to his own documents. Uh, during this process, the appeal period expired. Uh, he was uh, denied access on, through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, the appeal period expired, and while the he was trying to extend time to appeal uh, so that he could go to the Supreme Court of Canada and knowing that he was in this process, uh, unfortunately the police ordered that all of the exhibits in the case be destroyed and so we're left in the same boat that while there was at some point uh, a ton of um, exhibits that could have been tested and proved who the actual perpetrator was, everything was destroyed. Now, I know that policies were put in place after this to preserve evidence, but if I can uh, stress one thing, like the application of those policies and making sure that happens and making sure there's remedies for when that doesn't happen. Um, you know, maybe if uh, somebody has been maintaining innocence and there are certain thresholds that have to be met, maybe a sentence is reduced when everything is destroyed contrary to policy. Uh, there has to be something because otherwise it's, so sorry, uh, we destroyed all the evidence. Uh, we have a mechanism in place where you can post appeal, uh, review your claim, but we have nothing left for you to review. So I can't stress enough the importance of preserving evidence. The second thing I would talk about is uh, open police files uh, after the appeal period uh, has expired. Um, you know, we have case law that says uh, a police investigation, the fruits of the police investigation is really public property. Uh, it's uh, not uh, property of the police. And certainly uh, post-appeal, when you're going to review uh, these cases, we have to have access to the police files. First of all, somebody has to be looking, so you have to have organizations like uh, the Innocence Project or another post-conviction review organization looking for it. They have to be preserved, and then you have to have access. Uh, and this is the major problem we face uh, in uh, BC is uh, is the access. That's where we get stuck. Uh, and I recently had a conversation with a colleague in um, uh, Washington uh, State who says, oh yeah, we, we write uh, under the Public Disclosure Act, and please correct me if I'm not naming the legislation, uh, but we write, we send a letter, we say under the Public Disclosure Act, section 40. 2.56, we request the following, you know, police reports, exhibit reports, exhibit logs, continuation reports, whatever, 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 uh, and they're required to provide it. Here, uh, we have a protocol in place that we've got to write to the Crown. We have to set out the facts of the case. We have to set out uh, why we think the person was wrongly convicted, uh, specific evidence that we want, uh, so, you know, to, to confirm that the person is wrongly convicted. I mean, we basically have to go to them being able to prove their innocence before we even get the materials. Uh, so uh, you can understand the catch-22 that we're in. It's way too high a threshold, and uh, I, I, I really would love to um, try to change that in BC in terms of being able to access information. Uh, we've offered to go in. You know, It should not be a resource problem. It should not be a floodgates problem uh, because you can put uh, barriers in place or restrictions uh, to go in to review the police file. Um, and obviously the protection should be in place there, you know, informer privilege would be protected, uh, ongoing investigations, all of those would still be in place. But what is the downside? It's all information that should have been disclosed to defense in the first place. Uh, so access to police files, crown disclosure, same thing. Uh, we have no uh, policy in BC uh, relating to post appeal disclosure. Uh, and it's a huge problem. There's inconsistency in all of our cases. They're mostly, uh, cooperative to a certain extent, uh, but uh, they're guided by the police. So we have to go to the Crown for everything. We don't go directly to the police, and then the Crown go to the police, and then the police decide whether or not they're going to give us access to files. And, uh, you know, um, Doug, you wrote a paper, you know, with Liz uh, Campbell a number of years ago um, talking about uh, uh, wrongful convictions in Canada, and, and one of the things you talked about was ongoing disclosure and that it shouldn't matter uh, whether there's appeal an appeal pending. Uh, what we've experienced in dealing uh, uh, with the RCMP, unfortunately, is you know just yesterday, in fact, as a, a very recent example, uh, they said they will not give us uh, certain pieces of information until we file an application with the minister. Uh, so it's it, 
you know, there seems to be real inconsistency because obviously the VPD has a, a different um, a position than other police agencies. So uh, it's very, very difficult to access information and a disclosure of information is a huge problem. The same with release of exhibits. And finally, uh, the last two are DNA access legislation. In the states, all 50 states have some form of DNA access legislation and there's been criticisms of some of the pieces of legislation, limited in scope, etc. We have nothing in Canada uh, for an organization like ours or an applicant to access a physical exhibit for testing uh, post-conviction, uh, you know, in response to changes in DNA technology. So that's a huge one. And finally, as uh, uh, David uh, referred to, an independent body. You know, I, I never hold out the project as uh, the be-all and end-all to um, reviewing wrongful convictions uh, in BC or in Canada. Uh, we need an independent body. It's been recommended in seven commissions of inquiry, a properly funded independent body that will look at these cases. And I know the CCRC uh, in uh, the UK has been held out as a model. I think that's a great uh, model, except that we are a much larger country geographically, and that if we're going to Im Im um, implement a model like that, we would have to have have branch offices because I really believe that the the importance of, of local knowledge informs these uh, reviews uh, and I'm a huge believer in a multidisciplinary practice so if we have a system like that I do believe that we should have police and have Crown Council and have defense lawyers working together to look at these cases because everybody brings a useful perspective when you're looking for the truth. That's about it. I'll open it up to questions. <laughs> We have time for a few questions. Any questions? Can I get, can I get a raise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over there. When you're talking about the stuff that Crown wants you to file um, just to get access to documents, how, what do they reply when, when they say you have to state specific evidence uh, that you want, and it sounds like it has to be probative, right? What if you don't know that the evidence even exists? Like, when you say that to them, are they like, yeah, too bad, whatever? Uh, <laughs> well, that, that's the problem that we, we write back very politely. Uh, you know, one of the things they, they have us do is uh, an inventory of documents. So they say, before we tell you what we have, you need to tell us what you have, and then we'll compare it to what we have and give you what you don't have. And it just seems to me like a huge waste of time on their part, yeah. uh, when it's all information that should have been disclosed in the first place, was presumably disclosed in the first place, and vetted at that time. Uh, so at this stage, why do we need to vet it again? Uh, and why can't you just open up the file, let us come in and look at it? Uh, you know, we've even offered to um, undertake, you know, to, you know, we're not going to share it with our applicant, or, you know, we can make yeah. undertakings, we can make whatever arrangements make you, Crown, feel comfortable in us looking at this to see if anything was missed because we know from wrongful convictions, uh, looking at wrongful convictions in Canada, that stuff gets missed. Uh, you know, you look at Driscoll and Moran and um, Marshall, they're all cases where uh, they had huge disclosure problems and evidence was missed, either intentionally or unintentionally. I like to think it's not intentional uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where the gap is between police and Crown. Usually it's, it's that relevance determination, uh, and sometimes the relevance determination and what's relevant to a case, it's very easy to fall into, well, it's relevant if it fits the police theory and not relevant if it doesn't, um, you know, which, which is difficult. And one of the things I, I would suggest is that in, in major homicide cases that there be a little bit more Crown oversight or involvement in terms of that relevance determination. It, if it may assist the defense, it should be disclosed. Thank you. And, and yes, they, they, they come back to us with inadequate responses. I'm not sure if you answer this, but if so, maybe you could clarify for um, the preservation of evidence. Is there a way for if in the examples you gave, like they lost the evidence, is there a way for whoever that is or the government to be held accountable for that? No, <laughs> that's the problem. Uh, there's not. I mean, I I suppose 
in the um, eventual result that you you might prove the you know wrongful conviction or identify it as a wrongful conviction through whatever means you're going to go through, uh, and then that. You, if you could prove there was a negligent investigation and perhaps the losing of the evidence contributed you know, to the person being in custody for a long period of time, maybe you could sue under, uh, under that. It's certainly not my area of expertise, but yes, there are very there are inadequate responses to losing or destroying evidence in an untimely matter. Yeah. Um, so do we actually have a number of, of how many people in Canada have been wrongfully convicted? Because I, from my belief, I know in the United States they have a registry, but yeah. in Canada we don't. Well, AIDWIC is actually working on a registry, and I'm not sure if it's been rolled out yet, but we were uh, involved in helping a little bit. Uh, in you know, the, the first problem is identifying how we define wrongful conviction. Uh, you know, you, you get hung up on that first phase, but... I try to, and we have a list I think on our website and I have not updated it recently, but uh, I try to be quite conservative in what I'm identifying as a wrongful conviction and by my count I would say there's maybe between 55 and 60 identified wrongful convictions in Canada, but as I say I, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, Many uh, of those come from the gouge inquiry and you know, out of that like I think 14 came from that. Uh, so it's, you know, that, that's identified wrongful convictions, and that's how I describe them, because when people say, well, how many wrongful convictions are there here? Who knows, until we start you know, putting the processes in place that allow us to actually look at it. Tamara, okay. just very quickly. Yeah. Uh, is this working? <laughs> uh, Tamara, in relation to prosecution, as a result of my case, uh, malicious prosecution is now something that is uh, suable. In other words, if you can demonstrate, or it's demonstrable that the person was malicious. In other words, that means they're basically corrupt in, in what they're trying to, to do uh, to a client. Uh, do you find that, you know, with, with, over the period of time that you've been working with your clients, that you, you can see that, th that this is prevalent in any of the cases? Malicious prosecution is almost impossible to prove. It's, uh, you know very, very difficult to show somebody's intent uh, in their non-disclosure or whatever it was that, that they, um, they may have done wrong in, in the case. Uh, so it's a very, very difficult. And I think negligent investigation uh, gets us a little bit closer uh, or makes it a little bit easier to have a remedy, but malicious prosecution is a very difficult one. Don't, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, there's an awful lot of malicious prosecution taking place out there because uh, there probably isn't. The majority of people that are, are trying to, to make a difference uh, in the lives of, of uh, the people that they, they work for are trying to do so in a way that's just. But I think that it's a, it's a good point to remember that, you know, if you can demonstrate that, in fact, the people that are responsible for uh, doing their job properly have been malicious. In other words, they have been directed in a, in a way that they haven't been doing things right, that you can, in fact, sue them. Yeah, I think that, if I can end with anything, is that I, I don't think that prosecutors and, and police in, in Canada or elsewhere uh, for the most part, intentionally set out to convict the innocent. Uh, I think it, it happens uh, through a, a, you know, a whole series of circumstances that we've identified today. That's a good point.